Hello everybody, Tom Ellsworth. Welcome back to Case Studies. This is where you can learn things that happen to other companies and apply them to yourself. Today's topic is Nokia and we're gonna learn two things today. The first is to know the difference between confidence and hubris when you're being successful and you're growing and moving along. And the second point is to understand and have it in your heart that what got you here won't get you there. And we're gonna apply those two points and I'm gonna show you how you can use them learning what happened to Nokia. So let's go. Nokia is one of my favorites because it's a, it's a handset maker. And I came from the wireless industry early in my career, so I know a lot about this industry. And it's one of my favorite case studies, even though it really kind of had a sad ending for a lot of people and employees. But it is what it is, and it's made something that we can all learn from. So Nokia started, believe it or not, as a paper mill back in the 1800s. And somehow between then and you know, in 1990, they got into wireless phones and they started making phones. Really high quality little phones for you and me, basic phones. No innovation. Their innovation was that they could make millions and millions of phones every month, make them very inexpensively, and ship them anywhere. That's what they did. Style, function, innovation in the future, that wasn't their set of cards. Make them really good, make them simple, make them small, and get them at a low price to you and me. And quite often we got them for free. Remember those days? You had a two-year contract and you got your little Nokia phone and away you went. Along the way though, some things happened and that's what we're gonna learn about. In the great confidence of being able to dominate an industry, by 1998, they had 52% global market share cranking out millions and millions of phones every month. And they were very confident and they were very bold in that. And I knew people at wireless carriers used to say they used to negotiate really tough with them and they were a, a force to be reckoned with. And so they had a lot of confidence and what we would soon find out is that confidence was hubris. The difference between confidence and hubris, you can be confident going out to play a game or do something. Hubris thinks you've already won before you got there and you're cocky. And that means you can get caught by surprise, and that's exactly what happened to Nokia when life started moving toward content. You know, I know a little bit about content because in 2001, uh, I was working at Sprint, and I was running a wireless incubator where Sprint, with help from uh, Qualcomm, and actually Qualcomm's right here on my shirt, they make chips for phones, lots and lots of chips, and they were foreseeing a future where our phones would be doing so much. Sprint knew about that in this incubator. We were helping build little companies that would build stuff that the consumer would use tomorrow. One of those was wireless games. And a little company named Jamdat Mobile was funded in that wireless incubator. I was fortunate enough to actually leave Sprint and join Jamdat Mobile and join those founders and go on a run. And while we were building content for the future, it was very interesting. Companies like Samsung and Motorola were starting to build bigger phones and take advantage of Qualcomm's really cool chips and put bigger batteries into them so they could do more. And Jamdat, we made a great game called Jamdat Bowling. And between 2002 and 2003, we sold millions of copies of Jamdat Bowling. Along that same time, we had noticed Nokia, who had I had known as this giant in the industry, all they were really doing was they made the battery a little bigger, they added a color display, but they really didn't get with the program in terms of content. They were trying to wedge certain features into all their old little phones. Whereas Motorola, I don't know if some of you remember, built this thing called the Razer, which was one of the greatest, most popular phones. Had a big screen on it, an easy to use menu key, made it perfect for playing games, texting and doing all these cool things that mobile phones were now being able to do. Meanwhile, Nokia stuck with their little, we used to call them candy bar phones, little basic little phones. And they just weren't with the program. And actually they were kind of a pain in the neck to work with because we're trying to make our content and games at Jamdat do all these really cool things on phones. And unfortunately, you had a Nokia phone where you, you just couldn't do too much with it. And so that was, uh, I kind of saw, and everybody in the industry saw that there was gonna be big changes for Nokia. And they were a giant, um, a big giant. And a giant, sometimes it was tough to deal with. They negotiated really tough with wireless carriers. And they were also, 
You know, they could, if you needed millions of phones to sell, they could get you the millions of phones to sell. And if you didn't have any phones to sell, you know, you were screwed. So in a lot of ways, you had to work with them. But they weren't evolving to the future. And I saw it, and a lot of people saw it, and I don't think Nokia saw it. Or if they did see it, they weren't paying attention. And they had such hubris and confidence in their position that they missed it. Let's go take a look at a little chart I made, because I'll tell you what happened. And here we are in 2007, and Nokia's got 52% market share. And guess what happens sitting there in 2007? The iPhone. Yeah, my crude attempt at an Apple logo, but there's the iPhone gets it introduced. And if you're in the United States, you remember that it was introduced through one, just one carrier. And people thought, wow, that's a really cool phone. Those of us that were making content, we knew that was the future. What was really interesting is there was a little company you may remember called Danger that made a very, very interesting uh, phone that T-Mobile had been able to get into the hands of celebrities and it was called the Danger to, you know, if you, I don't know if you remember it, but ultimately Google says, I'm gonna get into this game and the way I'm gonna get in, I'm gonna buy Danger. So here you have Google, not a mobile phone company, not a mobile software company, buying Danger to get in the game well, Nokia really wasn't doing anything. Uh, they were putting color in it. They knew content was important, but when you looked at their product line, they really didn't get there. And so what they didn't realize is what gets you here, the ability to make all these phones and make them fast and make millions of them, isn't gonna get you there. A new world order where now content is king and you need storage, you need bigger displays, and you need features so that you and me could do so much more with getting to the internet, playing games, doing all these things. Well, what got you there isn't going to get you over here. And Nokia found out the hard way. This is a little chart here I drew, but this is really what happened to their market share. Between 07 and, and 2012, Nokia's market share went from 52% all the way down to 2%. And here comes the Android guy, and here comes multiple versions of the iPhone. And you, you just can't think of an industry where somebody that had built up to such a dominant position was just gone in such a short amount of time. I think that if you really you know, look back, you know, now you can say, oh, everybody saw it coming. But then you say to yourself, Nokia had smart people, and the answer was they just had a lot of corporate hubris about who they were. They whiffed. They didn't you know, buy companies where they had opportunities to maybe buy companies that would get them there, and they just missed on the content deal. And um, the ending of the story is in 2014, Microsoft actually bought what was left of Nokia. And I say what was left because they paid $7.2 billion for it. And after they bought it, one year later, with market share having dropped down again, they actually wrote it off for $7.6 billion. Let me give you those two numbers. They bought it for $7.2, and then they wrote it off for $7.6, which means they made other investment after they bought it, and Microsoft was like, wow, that, that year was a bad dream, and that was it. And then Nokia's brand and a few patents were sold to an offshore company. And if you look around, you can see a few Nokia phones because that little company is trying to do it. But big Nokia, they're gone. This year, when they had 52% market share, they, they sold more than 450 million phones. Half a billion phones, almost half a billion phones to gone bought by Microsoft and then written off. When Microsoft bought Nokia, everybody, including Steve Ballmer, who now owns the Clippers, was very excited. They thought that all that Nokia technology and what they were doing was gonna add to Microsoft Windows phones. And we know that Microsoft Windows phones never got any sort of traction. In 2016, when it all came to a head and it was done, there was this press conference and the CEO of Nokia was seen there actually crying and saying, you know, we didn't do anything wrong and somehow we lost. You know, that really bothered me when I saw it because I said to myself, wait a minute, you did do something wrong. You, you forgot that life doesn't stand still and you were cocky and you had a lot of hubris when you dealt with all the wireless carriers. And here you're saying, I didn't do anything wrong, I just lost? Really, 
What you did wrong was you failed to understand content. What you did wrong was you underestimated competition. You underestimated Google that wasn't even in mobile phones, buying a company called Danger and building the Android operating system. You missed that, yet you had the kind of clout and the kind of dollars, you could have done that, you could have made that move. So to sit there and cry and say, we didn't do anything wrong, but somehow we lost, I just can't go with that. That's hubris and that's denial, and I think that just underlines that Nokia didn't understand that what got you here can't get you there, and they were full of hubris and they missed all the signs to terrible consequence because 7,800 people lost their jobs, and that's a huge tragedy. So that's the Nokia case study. I hope you got something out of that and can apply it to yourself. Now I need a pillow. I think I need the magic pillow. Here we go. If you like this, please come to Valuetainment to see more case studies and to see the best content on the internet for entrepreneurs featuring Patrick Bet David. Please subscribe here on YouTube. And until next time with more case studies, I'm Tom Ellsworth and I hope I left you better than I found you.